This film is part of Rebel Wisdom's series, The Science and Psychology of Polarisation. So Alex Evans used to be a UK government advisor working on climate change and other big policy areas until he became quite disillusioned with the lack of big inspiring stories behind government policy. So in 2017 he wrote this best-selling book called The Myth Gap, all about how he needed to recapture big inspiring stories of hope and renewal. Then he went on a bit of a journey over the last couple of years and he's now launching the Collective Psychology Project all about the growth in polarization and the need for a, a deeper shift towards collective psychology. And that's a subject we talk a lot about on this channel is polarization and what we might do about it. Mm -hmm. You may start, start with something about polarization or about politics, but you seem to end up in psychology. This is very much part of the story of how I ended up working on this, because then after the myth gap, um, I spent a year as a campaign director at Avars, the 47 million member global citizens movement. And part of my job there was running its Brexit campaign. And my brief was pretty clear. It was fight for the UK to remain in the EU. But it was as I was doing that, that I developed these increasing misgivings about, you know, well, actually, if we have a second referendum on Brexit, is that really going to heal this kind of septic wound in our politics? And then I took a sabbatical for six months um, and went to live in Jerusalem with my family um, for that period. And obviously, the political polarisation there is even more extreme. Um, and at one level, that was incredibly depressing. And I could see the kind of similarities with Brexit or with Trump's America. I mean, obviously, it's more extreme uh, in Israel and Palestine. But nevertheless, it felt like it was on the same spectrum in some sense. But what was hopeful uh, when I was there was finding the work of a few psychologists, people like Gina Ross, who are arguing that really to understand polarization there you can't divorce it from its mental health context, particularly the fact that continuous traumatic stress, which is a bit like post-traumatic stress disorder when it's not post, when it's just an everyday ongoing reality, that of course that catalyzes polarization because the classic symptoms of continuous traumatic stress are things like anxiety and hypervigilance and especially othering, kind of projecting everyone onto some idealized shadowy other. Um, and when enough individuals display these symptoms, of course they start to manifest politically too. And, you know, of course, the, the other reality there is that people live in this constant low-level state of threat perception. I mean, Israelis are constantly, uh, at some level, perceiving threats of terrorism or of rocket attacks or even of invasion. And then Palestinians are constantly perceiving the threat of arbitrary arrest or of their house being the next to be demolished or of just living in kind of conditions of more or less total surveillance. So everyone's triggered all of the time. And then, you know, I mean, at another level, you look at that and you think, well, I can see how this plays out in a kind of conflict zone like this. But actually, is it, re is it overreaching a bit to say that this is also relevant to Brexit or to Trump? And of course, I'm not saying that you know, most voters in Britain or the States are traumatized in the strict medical sense. But the threat perception absolutely shows up. When you look at opinion polling of why did people vote Trump, one of the strongest predictors for that was this sense that the American way of life is threatened. And it was the same with Leave voters in the UK, many of whom, clear majority of whom agreed like, you know, Britain increasingly feels like a foreign country and that makes me feel uncomfortable. So there's threat perception on that side. And then, of course, as soon as you've had the presidential election in 2016 or the Brexit referendum, all the kind of um, liberal, cosmopolitan, internationalist type people also wake up feeling like they're living in a foreign country and that makes them feel very uncomfortable. Now you know how it feels. Right. Almost. And so the threat perception is contagious. And this is the big risk that it becomes a kind of self-amplifying feedback loop. And so one of the questions right at the heart of the Collective Psychology Project is, well, how would we reverse the polarity of that feedback loop? So instead of, you know, these kind of mutually reinforcing, you know, threat perceptions across the political spectrum, we have a kind of mutual reinforcing process of sort of healing and coming back together to a sense of empathy for each other and respect for each other's experiences and how we reach the values that we've got and so on. I mean, my only concern with that narrative is that it can seem almost condescending because you're sort of saying... And when we talk about these things, when we talk about Trump or we talk about Brexit as being only a product of sort of fear, it, it can sound like more of the liberal elite kind of thinking, well, we know better than you what, why you've done something. 
How do you avoid that in the narrative around this kind of right. conversation? Well, I think, I mean, as I say, I think the issue of threat perception is by no means confined to one side of the political spectrum. I think, on the contrary, it's something that's sort of cropping up here, there, and everywhere. But I mean, of course, you know, you can look at, for instance, membership of the European Union and make a completely trenchant critique of the EU on very solid rational bases um, that has nothing to do with threat perception or fear or anything like that. And I would, as it happens, buy a lot of that critique myself. There's much about the EU that needs reforming. But I think when you look at the state of our political debate and how much kind of triggering there is and how much just heat and you know, projection there is in the discourse, there's something deeper going on here as well. And what would you say that deepening is? Is it, is it that, do you think it's tied to social media or why do you think that the level of threat perception is rising right. as high as it is right now? So I think, I mean, when you look at drivers of political polarization, um, and I, I've just finished a big study on this for NYU, the literature out there tends to talk about three baskets of issues. And one is about the political stuff. People feel deeply disaffected with political systems, with elites, corruption, and so on. Second, you have a basket of stuff that's to do with economics, and partly that's about social mobility and unemployment and inequality, but especially it seems to be this issue of perceived relative economic deprivation, that you feel you're doing less well than other people, or maybe less well than you used to be doing. And then the third basket is all about culture and values um, and identity, and that's where issues like immigration, which are obviously very polarizing, sit. So there's those three baskets, but I think What's maybe been less well explored is the extent to which each of those three baskets has this psychological substrate, this sort of um, place where those issues out there in the world come into our mental environments and how we perceive them and whether we perceive them as threatening, scary, triggering, etc. And this is not an area that's either well explored or that we invest much as a society in you know, helping us to build our capacities on. I mean, I saw a lot of the Cambridge Analytica story uh, when I was working at Avaz. And, you know, I think it's such a fascinating lesson in how this data company was essentially able to weaponize our own anxieties against us to use this combination of psychological targeting and technology, in particular uh, social media micro-targeting, to kind of press our buttons with a very high degree of precision and prompt a critical mass of people to see the world in them and us terms just when it really counted and thereby tip an election. And my takeaway from that is that it turns out that democracy really depends on having a citizenry that has a capacity to manage its mental and emotional states. But then if you look at, you know, is that something we teach in schools? No, not really. Is that something that we put significant resource into in the health service? No, not really. We're actually pretty unsure whose job it is to help us navigate those things that are right at the cusp of inner and outer and right at the cusp of the individual and the collective. I think that's probably because historically this has been what religions have been in charge of. And then as religiosity has declined and as religion has retreated from public life, we sort of looked around thinking, well, who's in charge of this now? And we're really not sure. You talked about the need to kind of build that kind of capacity. How do you think we might do that? Right. So. Actually, I think there's a lot of fascinating work already happening out there. One of the things that the report talks about is that there's these three transitions that are really important for us to make, both individually and collectively. And the first one is from this kind of fight or flight mode through to having enough self-awareness to choose how to react to situations. The second one is to move from powerlessness, which is something that lots of people feel, whether it's at home or at work or in their communities or especially in politics, towards a sense of agency, of being able to chart their own course in life and to help shape the course of society. And then the third one is a transition from disconnection and especially loneliness through to a sense of belonging. Um, and, you know, there's really great work happening out there in each of those three fields. I mean, on building self-awareness, look at um, meditation apps like Calm or Headspace, look at organizations like Cure Violence in Chicago who are incredibly good at identifying people who are at risk of getting involved in gang violence and then focusing mental health support on them to help them kind of manage their states uh, and cool off instead of acting out when they're triggered. So these are you know, great examples. This is stuff you can teach and stuff you can learn. Or if you want to look at um, 
you know, building capacity for people to feel a sense of agency. There's some great trainings out there, whether that's trainings to help you have difficult conversations or figure out your life purpose or build a political movement that wants to go and change the world. Those trainings exist. Um, or on belonging. I mean, there's incredible work being done by people like the CARES family or Participatory City who are both doing really great on the ground work to build social connections in places where they've really frayed. So that's the good news, that there are these really bright spots um, and that this is stuff that we can train and learn and get better at. But, you know, the bad news is that overall, as a society, we invest very, very little in this stuff. Uh, and there's a ton of unmet need. So, you know, we're starting from a low base, but we have some sense of, you know, where we need to get, go to. And could you talk a little bit about the journey that you've come to to, to get to this point? Because I know that you used to work You've been an advisor for the government for many years, and um, what I understand is that you kind of realise that the solutions to these problems needs to come from a deeper level than we're normally looking for. Right. So I spent a long time as a policy wonk in various guises. Um, I spent most of my 20s wishing I was Josh Lyman in the West Wing, and so I worked as a special advisor for two British government ministers, worked in the UN Secretary General's office for lots of think tanks. And my whole kind of theory of change, if you like, all that time was that you basically get the right evidence, you put it in front of the right policymakers, and then things will happen. And I started to realise increasingly, I suppose, from about 2011 onwards, that that wasn't really true. Um, there was a particularly disillusioning United Nations process that I was part of, which I went into thinking, this is my dream job to get evidence in front of policymakers, and it was very dispiriting. And that sent me on this journey of wondering, well, you know, if evidence and data and arguments don't change the world, then what does? And the first kind of big part of that story was that um, it's storytelling that really changes the world. And that's something that I wrote about in a book called The Myth Gap, which came out in 2017. And the book was published just after the Brexit referendum and just after Trump's victory. And of course, when you looked at people like Trump or Nigel Farage, you know, these clearly weren't people who triumphed because of the quality of their evidence base. They were just incredible storytellers with particularly this knack for tapping into people's fears and kind of activating and amplifying those fears. And so what the myth gap was really about was a sense of that, you know, people on the authoritarian populist right are very good at telling these deep stories that particularly tap into the modern absence of myth, these kind of shared stories that talk about where we are and how we got here and who we are. And so at the time I wrote The Myth Gap, I thought, well, this is straightforward. Progressive people, you know, liberals and activists and campaigners need to be just as good at storytelling and then we'll take on the populists and we'll win. But since then, I've become much more interested in just populism, sorry, polarization itself is the problem that, you know, actually if all we're doing is creating more weapons for progressives to fight conservatives with, we're just deepening this rift in our politics. And actually, that's the thing that we have to heal if we want to move forward from where we are now. Are you familiar with um, polyvagal theory? Yes. And right. the idea, so we did an interview with Peter Levine recently, who worked very closely with Stephen Porges, who came up with the idea of polyvagal theory. And we're also very familiar with this sort of more trauma-based work from our retreats and the personal growth stuff. And my sense is that this kind of understanding about threat perception, about how we orient ourselves, and particularly what I think polyvagal theory is really important at is saying we can either be in an exploratory framework where we can accept new information and we can make contact with people, or in a defensive framework. And when we're in this defensive framework, everything that's coming in feels like a threat. Right. So I'm no kind of expert in polyvagal theory, but I think it's an absolutely fascinating avenue of inquiry. And it makes sense to me. And as more generally does the work of people like Peter Levine in identifying that, you know, trauma is not just something that lives in our heads, that it has a physiological reality. It's very much embedded and stored uh, in the body. So I think, you know, this is one of the strands that can really help us to become better at managing our states, to kind of know when we're triggered into fight or flight mode and take the time to step back, untrigger, you know, move back into a more reflective, conscious frame of mind. Um, and again, you know, this is absolutely critical stuff for 21st century citizens 
um, to be able to do. It really matters for the health of our politics. And you've worked within the political machine, so you've got kind of an idea about where, like how out there is this kind of talk, this kind of work, um, compared to where the political conversation is now? Right. Uh, and how much hope do you have? Because there is this sort of sense, at least in the UK, of ever decreasing circles. I mean, everyone's running out of ideas and running, it just feels like politics is running down right. rapidly. Yeah. What, what's the distance between sort of the political machine and this kind of conversation? So I certainly don't think mainstream political discourse is here yet. I mean, one of the ideas at the heart of the report that we've just produced is the idea that the inner and outer crises that we see in the world and inside us are two sides of the same coin. So on the one hand, you have this sort of pile of crises out there in the world, like climate breakdown and hyper inequality and mass extinction and so on. And then over here, you've got this pile of mental health crises like suicide and self-harm and anxiety and depression and addiction and so on and so on. And what I'm arguing in the report is that at the moment, you know, these two sets of crises are fueling each other. We feel messed up uh, inside, partly because we feel like the world is messed up out there. And when we feel messed up inside, when we're kind of triggered, we act out in ways that worsen the state of the world. So again, it's another example of a feedback loop. Now, you look at mainstream politics as it is today, or for that matter, the kind of campaigning that you get from big global NGOs, it only talks about the outer stuff. It's all about you know, issues in the world out there. And it's just silent on the question of the states of mind of the citizens who are voting or the policymakers who are making the decision. It's sort of, you know, they're just completely separate. Now, the good news is that I think certainly politics is paying much more attention to mental health issues. So loneliness now has a dedicated minister in the UK, for example. And, you know, mindfulness now has an all party group in the British Parliament. Um, there are lots of policymakers who meditate. So there's this, you know, just like the rest of society, people who work in politics have been increasingly realizing that yes, mental health matters. But what we're not seeing is that synthesis of recognizing that you know, our mental health, our state uh, of mind matter for the state of the world and vice versa. But I think that's partly because this isn't an idea that's really surfaced much until recently. And now it feels like a lot of people are converging onto this territory. I mean, I don't feel at all like the Collective Psychology Project's the only player in this space. I think a ton of people are sort of converging on this space, which gives me a lot of hope. It feels like this is something that's kind of ripe, that's ready to you know, mature and take root in the world. And I think, therefore, like, you know, I, I don't see this as like expecting massive pushback from people who work in politics on this stuff. I think that it's just a question of we have to figure out how to start seeding it so it can take root and sprout. And do you sense that the right place to start is politics? Because I've, I've kind of had this thought as well with we, we run personal growth retreats. We've always been interested in bringing that kind of deeper dimension into what we're doing. Right. And my sense is that the only way to change it really is to start with culture. Yeah. is to change the cultural narrative around psychology, around personal growth, around therapy, around all mm. these topics, mm. because politics will always play catch up to, to culture rather than the other way around. Yeah. Like it's very, I, I can't really imagine presenting something to a minister and getting them to buy into it. It sort of seems that it has to come from, from culture more. Right, I'm very much in the same place as you. I mean, I think if, if you took this idea, which is all about kind of our state of consciousness and how that creates the conditions for things to arise politically, whether that's good things or really bad things, which is what we're seeing a lot of at the moment. Um, you know, that's a very distributed, grassrootsy, collective sort of proposition. And you know, it's not this kind of little bite-sized thing that you can make into a lobbying ask on politicians or that kind of thing. But I think that there's also a question there of what do we mean by politics? If we just mean what happens inside the Westminster village, then yeah, this stuff is you know, at the moment quite far from that. Um, even if we interpret politics as meaning kind of activism, I mean, again, it's like a relatively small subset of people in the population who would see themselves as activists. And there's a much bigger group of people who see activists as like a different sort of person to me. So, you know, maybe they're kind of troublemakers. And so part of our problem, I think, is that we regarded politics as something to be delegated to politicians or to activists, but not something that, you know, we as ordinary people do ourselves. Whereas actually, you know, that's of course what the idea of citizenship is all about. And that's why 
I'm very interested in you know, the idea of what constitutes 21st century citizenship, what skills does the 21st century citizen need, and you know, in particular, what state management capacities, what you know, sense of agency and belonging does that citizen rely on in, a, in order to be able to do politics healthily, constructively, you know, in a way that builds futures that we actually want. You talked about the, that there's a gap in society where religion used to be. Mm. And I remember I read The Myth Gap when you brought it out a couple of years ago, and I thought that was really a really, really good um, way of, of looking at, okay, what are the deep, what is the deep mythos that we're missing? What is the gap uh, right. that religion filled that we need to re-occupy? Yeah. So it's a really interesting one. I think there are lots of facets to the gap. I mean, as you say, the myth gap was very much about the kind of deep collective stories that religion used to provide. Well, and still, of course, does provide, but you know, not to the same extent, not in the sense of being universally shared reference points in the way that they would once have been um, in individual societies. So the story aspect is part of it. I think in the Collective Psychology Project, um, it's a little less about the stories and a bit more about, if you like, the social services that religions have historically provided. So I think that when you look at kind of putting tools for building self-awareness out into the world, at their best, what religions have done is offered things like, you know, meditation and prayer, which are very effective, tried and tested tools for managing your emotional state. Or if you look at the question of how religions have helped people to build agency, I mean, until the mid-1960s, so many big transformational political movements were rooted in communities of faith, whether that's the abolition of slavery or um, the American civil rights struggle in the 50s and 60s, um, you know, or um, I can't remember the other example. <laughs> well, the Methodists, the Labour Party. Well, the Party. birth of the Labour Party is another one, but there's another particular example that I can't remember. Oh, women's suffrage? No, cancellation of third world debt, actually, in, um, in the 1990s and the uh, early 2000s. Again, very much rooted um, in faith communities. So, again, at their best, religions have really performed this role of kind of putting tools for agency out there into the world. And in terms of belonging, of course, Religions have been all about creating congregational spaces where people feel like they can belong in spite of their differences, in spite of their shortcomings. So that's, if you like, a separate set of things um, that religions have historically done for us. But, you know, as with myth, it's something that turns out to be incredibly important for our collective psychological health. And now we're looking around for, you know, how to fill that gap. So I think in a way the myth gap was sort of, you know, just the beginning, the thin end of the wedge in this exploration of what, what we have lost as religion has receded from public life uh, and from our own lives. But I don't mean that to imply that, you know, the myth gap was an argument that we should all go back to church any more than the collective psychology project is an argument to say we need religion back because there are real reasons and often very good reasons why religious observance has declined. I mean, people are rightly ready to point to many of the hypocrisies of religions and all the instances where religion divides us rather than bringing us together and the many historical wrongs that have been perpetrated by religions. I'm not airily dismissing any of this. Um, I'm making a different argument which is more functional to say, okay, well, you know, if we have decided that religions are not going to perform these roles, someone else needs to perform these roles. And in the Collective Psychology Project, one of the arguments is that, you know, that the answer to whose job this stuff is, is all of us. This is not going to be solved for us by a small number of expert practitioners who are going to go off into a room and come back and, you know, come out with a solution. Because all of us already are practitioners of collective psychology, especially in an age this connected with social media and all the rest of it. So it really matters that, you know, we're practitioners of collective psychology in a conscious way rather than in an unconscious, triggered, reactive way, just kind of venting our shadows and our psychological gunk out there into public life in a completely kind of unreflective, unconscious way. Because, mm. yeah, the, there's collective psychology and there's the idea of sort of collective shadow. Right. And that's something that, that we've talked about quite a lot in, yeah. on the channel. It's like, for me, both Brexit and Trump were about kind of this what I call the liberal shadow, this sort of sense of 
we're we're so open, we're so um, tolerant to all these people apart from all these people over here, mm -hmm. like the deplorables famously in America, and people in America and in the UK picked up on that and just that that's what I think was a huge fuel of both Brexit and Trump. And, and what I don't see so much at the moment is a lot of progressives recognizing, oh wow, actually this is, we provoke this. Right. Um, and that seems to be a really important part of this collective psychology process, I'd say. Yeah, I, mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more, David. I mean, you look at the story of Change UK, this kind of brief insurgent political party in the UK, which now appears to be in its twilight just a few months after it was launched. But it was very frustrating to watch because on the one hand, it was supposed to be this kind of um, you know, standard bearer for the Remain cause. But on the other hand, there was just no acknowledgement of the real world grievances and injustices that helped create the political conditions in which Brexit could happen. And there was no display of listening. Um, and one of the interesting things I have been exploring in work I've done for New York University over the last few months about political polarization is from looking at countries that have experienced civil wars or other huge transitions where there's been very high risk, um, in many cases realized, of extreme political polarization. And there's a rich library of experience from those countries about the kinds of things that can rebuild common ground. And it's things like apologies and making a real show of listening. And, you know, often the kind of, this is something that populists obviously understand very well, that the performative dimensions of politics really matter, the kind of symbolic and the imagery and the stories. And again, you know, progressives are often bad at this because they, you know, just think, well, we've got the answer in terms of data and that's all you need. I mean, look at climate activists 10 years ago. They just thought, well, we've got the intergovernmental panel on climate change. It says we're right. You know, what else is there to say? And then, of course, the Tea Party came and ran rings around them in terms of storytelling and, you know, that led to losing basically 10 years of progress on climate change um, until they sort of realized they need to come back with a moral story about responsibility for the future. Um, and then that was what unlocked the Paris Climate Summit. So there are examples of progressives learning this lesson the hard way. But when you look at Brexit, um, you know, it's immensely frustrating to see how little learning there's been about you know, the grievances this came from, the necessity of listening, a kind of requirement for acknowledgement of the harm that's been done, um, you know, to kind of communities that have been forgotten about and left behind and disrespected, exactly as you say. Mm. Yeah, because this is, I mean, I asked a question like this earlier in the interview, but this is also my, my sense, my concern about these conversations when I hear them taking place among um, people looking at the kind of collective psychology side of it or the, the psychological side, what it what it can drift into sometimes is this sense of um, that that we understand we we the liberal classes understand what went on. Uh, it, yes, it was a protest, and yes, we acknowledge it, and then we can kind of move on to to w without a real acknowledgement of okay, what was it about our attitudes to more traditional communities, for example, that provoked the response that that came? And I think personally. I understand why Brexit and Trump happened, and in a way, I can see it as a positive thing because it's sort of the, it's mm. it's okay. Your society cannot become too fragmented and too right. pulled apart without some kind of healing that needs to take place. Right, and I think that's one of the interesting things about polarization: that political polarization is not necessarily bad. It can play this role of shining a light uh, on injustices that have gone ignored for too long. But it's only helpful if it, you know, if that shining of a light then leads to a kind of process of, right, let's now deal with these injustices and grievances that have been brought to light. If that doesn't happen, of course, the risk is it doesn't get the pain of the American white working class, the deindustrialization, all of those sort of things. Right. So, and there's, you know, profound pain and trauma and heartbreak on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, and it's important to attend to those wounds. They need sort of to be, you know, aired, if you like. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think it's, um, I mean, I, I think in the risk with framing something as collective psychology is it sounds, or it could sound like you're suggesting tea and sympathy as an alternative to getting serious about real world injustices that need to be sorted out through hard edged, you know, policy. And, 
I'm, the report takes a lot of care not to fall into that trap. I mean, that's why the stress on agency as one of the three key transitions. And this isn't just agency in the sense of having agency over your own life. This is very much about, yeah, we need the capacity to organize, whether that's locally or nationally, um, to right the kinds of wrongs that have led to this polarization. Um, and, you know, it comes back to that idea of citizenship again. Um, I think it's that, you know, if you think that it's a false dichotomy between inner and outer, um, and that, you know, the two interplay in all kinds of ways, um, you can't possibly solve it by only attending to the inner. It's understanding that there are all these feedback loops and that attending to the inner can help to unlock change in the outer as well. And where do you think is the most resistance to this message going to come from? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think, of course, there's a bunch of politicians and people in the media who are doing very well out of polarization and have no particular interest in rebuilding common ground or promoting empathy. Um, and I think you typically, wherever there's extreme polarization, you find those people at the extremes. I mean, my favorite illustration of this is how Osama bin Laden once observed um, at the time when the Iraq war was at its height, that it seems as if Al Qaeda and the White House are on the same team shooting at the United States' own goal because you know American policy in Iraq played so perfectly into Al Qaeda's objectives, despite the fact that it was being driven by the kind of most extreme, most polarized people within the Republican establishment in Washington. Um, and of course, that's exactly you know terrorism is the object lesson in this. It's designed to trigger a fear-based response that then widens the divide and increases recruitment um, by extremists at both ends of the spectrum. Uh, and, you know, you're straight back into that game of kind of feedback loops and the sort of center unraveling. And so, yeah, people who are doing well out of polarization, often for extremely cynical reasons, uh, will be the first to come out and, um, you know, take pot shots at this or anything else that's seeking to rebuild common ground. But the truth is that the scale of the challenges that we face, whether that's climate breakdown or mass extinction or the economic injustices that are building up in the world around us, these issues are way too big uh, to be dealt with by one side beating the other side. You're only going to solve climate change with a sense of common purpose that's shared across the whole of society. So we do really depend on rebuilding common ground in order to kind of navigate these global crises confronting us at this point. So. Where do you hope, what do you hope the report will achieve and where do you think we need to go next or where do you hope we go next? Right. So I think in the most immediate term, I hope that the report will kindle a sense of community in asking these questions because, as I said earlier, these are not areas that are going to be solved for us by expert practitioners. So it matters that we create more spaces where all of us can hold these questions um, and we definitely hope to be part of catalyzing that. I think there's also a big set of questions about mapping out what's already out there um, in terms of resources to help us build our collective psychological capacities and also to figure out what's already out there that is harmful because you know we're failing the first do no harm test in so many contexts and so many ways. So as well as building community one of the things we want to focus on at the project is some mapping projects looking at um, sectors like the UK campaigning sector for example or places like we're interested in running collective psychology maps in Leeds and in Bristol but to do these very participatory processes where we're engaging more people and sort of observing what in their space in their city or their sector is working what's not working where are their gaps where are their synergies where are the things that they could you know do with just a small tweak to their existing model um, that aren't being done at the moment so the mapping work is a big focus for the next six months. But then beyond that, I'm really interested in what sort of infrastructure we need to start making small bets in this sector, because this is, this is really embryonic work. We have no idea what's actually going to fly, what are going to be the interventions that can really have a transformational impact and go to scale. And we're at a point, therefore, where you know, if we make 10 little bets, nine of them are going to fail, and then maybe that last 10th bet has the potential to win big. So although we have a couple of small bets at the Collective Psychology Project we'd like to make, I think the larger question is how do we create 
systems and platforms for lots of little experiments, many of them very small scale or very local, and for making sure we share the learning from those experiments among a kind of evolving community of people who feel like they are practitioners of collective psychology. So that when we fail, we do it quickly and we make sure that as many people as possible have access to the lessons from that failure. And then, you know, we can iterate quickly um, and start to figure out what's going to work in this space. But, you know, we're starting from a pretty low base and we have a lot of work to do. Cool. Alex, thank you. Great. Thanks again for having me. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.